So I'm joined in the fishbowl this morning with Michael Ford from Resolver. Michael, thank you for joining us and just give us a little bit about yourself and Resolver, please. Okay, well my name's Michael Ford. Um, I've been a Python developer for about five years and 18 months ago I joined um, a firm called Resolver Systems. It's a new startup in, in London and we're developing a new spreadsheet application uh, aimed at the financial services market and it's written all in Iron Python. And this is you know, the great thing actually, it's written in Iron Python and, and I'm completely new to Iron Python. But what I've seen already this morning in your, in your brief examples is just some of the power that's actually there. So tell us a bit about the Resolver spreadsheet application and how it can be used. Okay, well Resolver is a .NET application. It's written with Windows Forms for the user interface. Um, and what it is, is it's, it's a new kind of spreadsheet. The, the, the three founders of Resolver, they all worked within the, the financial services industry. One was a consultant and one worked for investment bank, I think. And, um, and they saw that there, there were a lot of business folk who had to create business applications, um, usually for a very short-term opportunity, so they couldn't go to their IT department. And they were using Excel. And uh, at a certain level of complexity, these guys felt that there could be a better model, that rather than having the, um, your data and your formulae and your grid on one side and then your, your macro programming language on another side, that um, a better model would be to integrate this into one whole. So they came up with this idea for Resolver, uh, where what you enter into the grid is actually turned into um, a code in an interpreted language, and then you can put your, uh, the user can put code within the flow of the spreadsheet, and, it, and it's all within, within one whole, and that has all sorts of interesting consequences. Absolutely. I mean, you showed me that just now, and, and the fact that um, it's almost working as a macro recorder in terms of what the person's doing in the spreadsheet, but the power is that you've got that turned into Iron Python beneath, and all of those um, .NET libraries, .NET services, and, and original Python modules can all be integrated and even utilized in that code that's being produced. That's right, it, it works two ways. You, you can integrate with your IT infrastructure because IT can deliver to you uh, as .NET libraries um, or, or services and feeds that you can just hook into and you can put a little bit of code. That there's some, some of these facilities are built into the user interface, but you can, you can use those within your code very, very straightforwardly, just as straightforwardly as, as, as using Iron Python. Um, or, it can work, uh, or it can work the other way around. You, you, your, your spreadsheet with all your business rules implemented in it that's maybe been created by a business manager, that's actually completely represented by the generated code. So you can take that off, save that off as Iron Python code, and there you've got, there you've got your business rules available as a program that can just be integrated back into, into your IT infrastructure. And so this plays really well to the, the current sort of vogue in, in, in our industry of, of software plus services. Um, at least from a Microsoft's perspective, because you've got a tool that not only can consume a, a range of services being delivered, but it's also an authoring tool for, for the production of a service, if you like, that can be hosted out there in the, in the IT infrastructure and reused by other people. Now, there's two sides to Resolver, isn't there? Because there is the client side, Windows app, and then there is a server side aspect. That, to that's it. right, yeah. The, the client side is in beta. We're just going into uh, a public beta phase in about two or three weeks, so. If anyone wants to have a play and get their hands on it, uh, resolversystems.com, they can sign up for it. Um, we've got a server product which is currently in alpha phase, so it's going to be a while before that comes out. But yeah, the, the idea of that is that you can then create web applications ver very easily and then deliver that ac across the web actually as an application. Okay, but let's talk about the scale of the development. Um, because, um, as I said, I, I'm completely new to Iron Python, so there's some very interesting things here. You, you mentioned there's something like 130,000 lines of code in the project currently. 30,000 of, 30, of those are in the Windows client, and 100,000 are in, in the test harnesses that you that's constructed. Right, that's right, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's a, a good-sized project. So yeah, how, sort of, how are you sort managing of it? Size, isn't yeah, it? Well, how are you managing it? It's still, you know, how are you achieving the scale with, with uh, Iron Python in that sense? Well. Um, one of the reasons we came to Iron Python um, was because dynamic languages typically are much easier to test than, than, than static languages. You get this very rapid cycle, you've got no um, compile phase, and because they're dynamic, swapping out some of the types uh, in, in, in your test framework 
for, for mock types is, is all trivially easy. That's very standard stuff. And, and the, the, the two guys who started Resolver Programming, they wanted to follow uh, a test-driven development approach. They wanted uh, a well-tested product with um, test-driven development. Refactoring is much easier because as you start to change some of your core classes, which can be a, a frightening prospect, yeah. you've got all these tests which are going to tell you you know, yep, yeah, you've done it, everything's working, or no, hang on, you, you think you've done it, but actually the, this bit over here is still broken. Um, and, and Iron Python fitted very well with that. So we actually use, we, we use uh, source code control, we actually use Subversion. It's very easy to set up. Um, but but the, in, the, in the testing perspective, did, did you have to write your entire um, regression testing engine, or was there something you could utilize? There's built into the Python standard library, there's okay. a module called Unit Test. And, uh, the beauty of unit test is how easy it is to extend it, and uh, we've extended it a great deal. Well, we, we've added a functional test framework. If you watching our tests run is fantastic because um, the, the functional test suite they actually fire up Resolver, they automate all these actions. So you're seeing these windows pop up. It's resizing, it's bringing up dialogues, and it's performing actions, you know, from a user point of view, and then making assertions that the right thing, things have happened. So we've had to build that in because there was nobody who, who'd done a great deal of functional testing with Iron Python before and right. with Windows Forms. But, um, and we, testing, test, functionally testing GUI applications is, is not a trivial problem. So we've had all sorts of issues that we've been battling through. I mean, one thing is that this functional test framework, it actually stops and starts the event loop several hundred times through the course of the run, which is typically not how Windows Forms event loops are, are meant yeah. to be used. You know, so we've had a lot of fun with that. But, but the, actual, the actual basis of it, of extending unit testing that way, was, was very, very straightforward, really. Now, one of, one of the interesting things is having that iterative approach. Your, your development methodology is extreme programming, which they, That's right, so you're yes. paired off. How, how have you got on with that? Pairing's fantastic. Um, I'd recommend it to any programmer. I mean, there's all sorts of um, arguments you can make about how it improves developer productivity. I've certainly found that uh, in terms of keeping your mind on the job when there's two of you, if you want to get distracted, you actually have to conspire with your partner to get <laughs> distracted. But, but from my point of view, I, the, the most uh, important thing about pair programming is so much more fun. Yeah. It's such a better way to program. But, you know, but, does it depend, though, on your character and your, your partner's character? Well, sense, I, I think inevitably it has to. We're very lucky at Resolver. There's now six of us. We've just hired two more developers who will be starting shortly. So, so we're still a very small firm. We've got that yeah. kind of startup feel, and, and um, we all get on with, with each other. We all work well together. I imagine that trying to do it in an organization where you, if you've got someone who really doesn't want to pair and goes out of their way to make dif it difficult, I can imagine that would be a very painful experience. Yeah. So, so just tell, tell me about your, your workstation setup in that aspect then. I mean, is it li literally one machine, multiple monitors, two machines? How, how does it actually... Well, one of the things, the, the boss, Giles Thomas, who's, uh, he's a programmer, but he's also the CEO of... Uh, of Resolver, he's um, worked it in places where they use extreme programming before, and, and he, w he, he wanted to, to make sure that we all had a workstation that's like our workstation, because otherwise, he says, you tend to feel homeless as a programmer, you know, yeah, yeah. And your brakes just wandering aimlessly around. So we all have our own workstation with two, with two monitors. Uh, again, working with two monitors is, I guess, most, most people will know that now, most programs yeah, yeah. know, but it's a great way of increasing productivity. And, and two of us will sit at a desk, we'll uh, bring up our IDE, um, maybe start writing a functional test, start uh, discussing how we're going to test this, or uh, if we're unit testing, right, what's the API we, we, we need here, what's the best way of, of solving this problem. Okay. So, Michael, tell me about the, you know, the, the new and interesting things that are happening in the Iron Python world. Well, one of, one of the most exciting things, I think, is that my book is nearly ready. <laughs> Excellent. So, yes. so, so where will that be, when will that be available? And well, there's, there's already um, a big chunk of it's available by, via the Manning Early Access Program. So if you go to www.manning.com slash Ford, and that's F-O-O-R-D, don't forget, <laughs> then um, you can already get access to that. But um, it's actually going to be the early part of, of the new year when it comes out in, in print and paper. Yeah. Excellent stuff. Now, th there's also um, an open source project that Resolver started to help um, make one of those big bridges that, that will make uh, Iron Python really um, accessible to the .NET world and yeah, so on. Yeah, that, that's right. The, the um, Python is, it, is made up of Python, the core language, which is very faithfully implemented 
in Iron Python. Uh, that's been one of my great experiences of developing with Iron Python. Coming from a Python background was, wow, this is Python, and I've got all these new and exciting libraries to work with from the .NET framework. But Python also comes with this very big standard library, uh, and a, a lot of those are written in C, mm. um, and of course those, haven't, uh, those don't port across to Iron Python. And that's one of the barriers that stops um, some people using Iron Python when really it, it could be suitable for them. And um, we've had a lot of interest in Resolver, um, particularly from, surprisingly, from, from companies we weren't expecting, uh, including companies who are already making a great deal of use of Python. And so a, a tool that integrates with Python is very interesting to them, but they need to access the, the C extension modules that, that they're already making heavy use of. So we've started a project to, um, to write an interface layer, if you like, so that you can seam seamlessly use the C Python modules um, from within Iron Python. And we've already we, we've got two experimental approaches for that. There's, there's already code out there um, to do that, and that's something I'm really excited by, and something we've, we've had a great response from the Python community about as well. Yeah, fantastic, because that, that really will complete the circle, as it were, and, and bring in everything that's been built before, which, that's is, right, yes. which is brilliant stuff. Michael, thank you very much for joining us in the fishbowl. It's been great to talk to you. Thank you. Well, thank you.